The, uh, the anniversary of the, the Battle of the Atlantic has um, has come up, and it's very kind of um, important for me because I had an uncle who was serving in the, the Navy in the war in the Atlantic, and uh, he left a diary which gave a lot of detail about his times from the beginning of the war for the first 18 months. And he was just an ordinary Liverpool lad. He was 24 when the war broke out and he was born in Lime Street just up the road. And just like a lot of guys, when the war broke out, he was in an ordinary job working as a chef in a holiday camp on the south coast. And I think he must have known that this was gonna be a big deal because he'd never kept a diary before, and his diary started bang on, war breaking out. And his very first entry was a uh, Sunday the 3rd of September, war declared, or should I say, a state of war exists between England and Germany. So the first thing he did was packed up his job and went home, because he was in the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve, and he just knew that he was gonna get called up. And sure enough, on the 14th of September, I received my mobilisation papers and left a report to HMS Eaglet with full kit. I've been waiting a fortnight for this. So I think he was really up for it, you know. I think the, the thoughts of going to war for a 24-year-old must have been quite exciting. Uh, and his first posting was down to Portsmouth, where he had to do a lot of drill, which wasn't too exciting. Um, ammunition in ships and doing guard duty but he got his wish fairly shortly after that and was assigned to HMS Hawkins at the beginning of December uh, when they joined up they didn't really tell him what they were going to where they were going to go what kind of ship they were going to be on so it was all a big unknown really so off he goes uh, uh, they don't know where they're going but they're given tropical rigs so they think they're going to go somewhere hot and then the first thing that they know, they're pulling into Freetown in uh, Sierra Leone in Africa. And he said on the 17th of January, we arrived Freetown and the locals came out and died for pennies. We exchanged fruit baskets and plaited slippers for old clothes. I didn't bother bartering and I just bought what fruit I wanted in a canteen. So they still didn't know they were gonna go and they set off uh, yeah. and, and headed south again. They were given tropical kit, they were given two pairs of shorts and two, sh two tops and he said this just fitted in where it touched. But then they found out on the 18th of January they were going to the River Plate in Montevideo to take over as a flagship from the Achilles which had just been in a big battle with the Graf Spey. Now at the time this was a major battle in the beginning of the Second World War because the Graf Spey was a very powerful German battleship which terrorised enemy shipping and it was really important that they tried to, to take this ship out. But the only ships available were really small in comparison. There was the Ajax and the Achilles and the, and the Exeter and it, it was such an important battle that there was a, Hollywood made a big film about it after the war. Now the, the guy in charge of the fleet then was a guy called Admiral Harwood and just after the battle Ronnie's ship HMS Hawkins was due to come and pick him up and Hawkins was going to be his new flagship because the other ships had been blown to bits by the Graf Spey and when they, when they met the Admiral they also took on board several of the ratings that had been on board the other ships <coughs> and Ronnie was able to get a first-hand account of the Battle of the River Plate from one of the ratings, and I'll read you a little bit about what he says. He said, Talking to a chap from the Ajax, and he gave me an account of the Battle of the River Plate. He said, The Exeter was disabled 12 minutes after the first shot was fired, and the Ajax was also badly battered. The Achilles only lost seven men. She was the lucky one. I'll try and give it as he told me. I just turned in when the rattlers, which is action station's alarm, went off. And I ran to my action station and was looking around for the cause of the alarm when boom, and the sea seemed to boil. And the 
flash as the Exeter fired, and then another crash, and the Exeter seemed enveloped in flames. And the next I knew, we were hard at it. I don't remember much of the actual fight, just working the guns. And suddenly, a shell landed near us. It was hell. Messmates of mine, full of life and joking and laughing as they did their job, and next second they were shapeless forms lying on the deck. And boom, another salvo, and our gun is wiped out. I'm lucky I only got hit in the knee, just above the kneecap. A bit of uh, steel was sticking out of my leg, and the sick bay guy came and pulled it out, sewed it up, and bandaged it up. I went back to my gun, but it was damaged beyond repair, and a clearing up party were throwing the bodies overboard. He said, we had the Admiral to thank for being afloat. He was as cool as a cucumber. And there was a lot printed in the papers about the Ark Royal and the Repulse and the battleship waiting for the Graf Speed to come out of Montevideo. But it isn't true. The only ships waiting were the Ajax and Achilles. And Ajax only had one gun fit for action. It was a good bit of bluff. Had the Graf Speed come out fighting, she would have wiped us up. After the battle, a lot of chaps were scared to put to sea. Their nerves were all shot to pieces. I've had my belly full of fighting, and I'm not a coward. But when 11-inch shells come screaming at you, well, I know why the Navy supplies two pairs of pants. <laughs> so that was an account of the battle from an ordinary seaman. And it didn't really seem to put Ronnie off at all. He was still keen to get into a scrap. And I remember him as a lad as being a bit of a fighter. At, even at 70, he, he battered some guys who tried to break into the house in Wavertree. And I think the, uh, the captain recognized this quality in him because uh, when they were due to go into port in South America, there was a little bit of uh, pro-German feeling uh, in some of the ports. And they were warned that if they were not to get into a fight, but if they did fight, to fight hard and fight fair. And then later on, when they were looking for German raiders in the South Atlantic, they thought that they might be hiding out in a remote island called Gough Island. Now, they couldn't see anything from the ship, but they knew there was inlets in the island where a German warship might be hiding. So they sent a, a more or less a rowing boat with 10 men in it, mostly scousers and one officer with a pistol to go and look for enemy shipping inside the, the island. And they picked Ronnie because he knew he was good with his fists. <laughs> so when they got there, they found that there was no German ship there, but there was a lot of seals and birds and penguins. So they picked up two penguins and brought them back to the ship to show the lads. <laughs> And, you know, you can take the, the lads out of Liverpool, but you can't take Liverpool out of the lads. You know. They send a rowing boat with 10 scousers against the German warship with maybe 500 lads in it, and they come back with two penguins. <laughs> but being a long way from home in the Second World War was a problem getting in touch with your family. They only had letters in those days. There was no other way of keeping in touch. And mail was quite a big deal. And there was a lot of times, he says, when we thought there was going to be a mail boat for us, and one time there was a ship with mail on them that had been mined and went down. And there was always a rumour that the next ship that was going to be given provisions or oil had, had mail for them. So, the, you know, the, they'd been away for maybe two or three months without any contact from home. And then he made a note in uh, the end of February after being away since... December. He said at nine o'clock approximately last night we sighted a small tug heading for us and immediately all glasses and telescopes were trained on her and a buzz went round the ship. She has mail for us. Nobody believed it. There had been so many false alarms. And as she drew nearer some of the keener eyes verified the fact she had bags of some sort stowed behind the funnel. Then she turned broadside to us and everybody aboard broke into huge grins. There were unmistakably mail bags, and plenty of volunteers came forward to carry the bags to the wreck space where they were immediately sorted. I got 13 letters, two lots of everybody's, and three weekly posts. 
There was peace and quiet during the forenoon watch. Everybody happy and busy with their mail. And he, he mentions a bit later on when they had a mail delivery and he was painting the side of the ship. He escaped over the side and sat on the anchor to read his mail when the supervisor wouldn't see him. <laughs> but I think it, they, they were very worried at that part of the war because Germany was running rampant over Europe. And we can't imagine it now with hindsight, we knew what the outcome of the war was. But at that time, you know, every country seemed to be falling in front of Germany. Uh, Belgium and Holland went and they were hoping that the French were going to hold out and you know he was naturally worried about his family back home they're on the other side of the world in the South Atlantic and they don't know if he's going to come home to the Nazis being in Liverpool uh, on the four, Friday the 14th of June he says Italy entered the war and that certainly altered things the Jerrys seem to be getting all their own way in France and it makes us feel miserable and we're all longing to go home. I hope France doesn't give up. I for one couldn't live under a Nazi regime. And, you know, we can't imagine how that must have been for them. But uh, the folks at home were also must have been worried about them because there's always reports in the papers coming back of ships being torpedoed and for, there was actually a rumour that their ship had gone down in a big storm off the coast of Rio and uh, there was constant w worry all the time and just not enough information to fill in the gaps. So, uh, yeah, that sort of, you know, didn't, didn't put off the fact that they wanted to keep on going though, they knew that they had to keep fighting and you know, one entry in his diary, Ronnie says, uh, we heard today that France had capitulated, and believe me, my heart turned over. I can't imagine England being subjugated, and the feeling on the ship is one of frustration, stuck out here immobile. I hope Britain sticks out till the end. I'll fight till I die. And as for France, I thought they had more guts. So, what I've been reading to you today is just a few excerpts out of an ordinary seaman's diary from the Second World War. And he went on to see out the whole war. Uh, the ship later went round to the other side of Africa and escorted convoys from Durban up to the Red Sea. And those supply lines really kept everything going for this country. Uh, from Argentina, you know, we think they're, they're not our friends now, but then they were because they shipped loads of beef to us and uh, lots of stuff came from South America. Lots of food and supplies came from South Africa up through the Med, and the Navy had a big job on to keep all those supply routes open so that the country could keep going, and that's one of the reasons why we were able to survive, and we're not all wearing German helmets today. <laughs> so thanks very much for Thank listening. You. Thank you.